Okay, so first, I would like to thank organizers for inviting me here. It's uh, a great venue, great uh, program, and uh, excellent participants. So I'm really happy to be here. And in this talk, I would like to give you a flavor of uh, some problems uh, in uh, biomedicine that you can solve uh, using your background in machine learning. And I think that I will focus mostly on this uh, biomedical part, because I think it is really uh, important to know that uh, using your tools, you can do very important uh, tasks for the satisfaction of uh, people from quite different area of science. Okay, let's start with a few words about uh, me and uh, my uh, research. This colorful mind map somehow summarizes uh, different topics I'm involved during last decade or even longer. It's not very up to date. Recently, I'm doing mostly proteomics and uh, this genomics. And to refer to the lecture from yesterday in proteomics, I will touch this briefly. In proteomics, I'm developing methods based on optimal transport. It's, uh, it works excellent for the analysis of uh, spectroscopic data. Okay, you have depicted some color branches, some collaborations, and also the number of PhD students supervised by me. As you can see, I'm extremely experienced supervisor. <laughs> okay, well, here is the outline of my talk. I will start with uh, very, very short uh, introduction into Bayesian statistics. Then I will describe more in details one case study related to modeling the proteolysis process. This proteolysis is uh, simply cutting the proteins by enzyme in the cell. And uh, it was the first formal mathematical model designed for this process based on a data from high throughput experiments um, done by mass spectrometry. I also briefly touched this optimal transport algorithm because I am uh, very, very fascinated about it. Then I will describe uh, how to learn dynamic Bayesian networks for gene regulation, because it's also a central problem in molecular biology is to understand the regulation of genes and the synthesis of proteins. Okay. Well, so you can see Thomas Bayes. He was an uh, English theologian in the 18th century, and he formulated the theorem. But in fact, he was uh, not, uh, the, it was not nothing important for him. Um, later, Pierre Simon Laplace uh, independently published the theorem, which can be viewed as the most important. Uh, theorem in a data science because uh, it describes the act of learning. We somehow have a rule how to update our belief given some evidence. Okay, we have the posterior probability is the updated probability of belief given the evidence and it is equal to the prior 
likelihood over the marginal. So everybody knows what is it. And the crucial notion in this theorem is the conditional dependence. And uh, having the notion of conditional dependence, we can introduce uh, probabilistic graphical models. These models are graphs, and those graphs uh, code the structure of uh, conditional dependencies over the set of random variables. Depending on the type of the graph, there are several branches of those models. For undirected graphs, we talk about uh, Markov random fields, Markov networks, and uh, these are very popular in uh, physics and astronomy. And for directed models, directed graph, we have Bayesian networks when the graph is acyclic, and we have dynamic Bayesian networks when we allow for cycles in the graph. And uh, Bayesian networks are very popular in statistics and AI. And also, you can uh, apply the Bayesian neural networks when we allow for the distribution of weights, not only weights. OK. So as I said, the Bayesian network is somehow the compressed version of um, joint probability. We can factorize the joint probability of set of random variables using according to this dependence graph. For example, in this small three nodes graph, we have the probability of uh, joint probability of three variables A, B, C is equal to probability of A conditional on C multiplied by probability of B conditional by C and probability of C. And we can deduce that uh, A and B are con independent conditional. So given C, A and B are independent. OK, why? We w if you want to learn Bayesian network from the data, we have to consider two tasks. First is to learn a structure. It means uh, to find the maximum posteriori um, estimate of the graph. This step is much harder in general. Then the second is uh, finding the optimal um, estimate of parameters. The parameters are simply for each node in the graph, the conditional probability distribution of this uh, node, depending on the parents in the graph. And uh, also, it's important, uh, some nodes in the graph can be observed, but uh, some nodes can be hidden variables. And uh, depending on that, uh, whether we have or not these uh, hidden variables, uh, the learning process is easier or a bit harder. What are the hierarchical Bayesian models in standard version of Bayes' theorem, we have uh, only one level. We have uh, parameters and observables. We have a model and the data. But uh, we can construct more sophisticated structures with several layers. With uh, the observables have uh, some model. Model also has parameters. And those parameters also coming from another model with their 
own hyperparameters and so on. It will be used in our example to model the data acquisition process, which is highly non-trivial in, in the case of in the case of mass spectrometry. What is now we dive more into biology and uh, chemistry and somehow medicine. Okay, so I will talk about uh, two techniques, mass spectrometry and nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. You can view a mass spectrometer as an instrument to determine the weight of the particle very, very precisely. In fact, uh, the mass spectrometer accelerates particles in electromagnetic field and it measures the mass over charge ratio. But it's not crucial in our application. And uh, we are in my group uh, developing, so I think already like uh, 10 years, we are working on algorithm for the analysis of uh, mass spectrometry data. And we propose several algorithms for simulation of spectra. It means if you have a molecular formula of a particle, you can, of course, take this particle, the population of uh, molecules, and put it into the mass spectrometer, and you can look at the experimental spectra. But on the other hand, if you have a molecular formula which specify, specifies how many atoms uh, of uh, each um, elementary, is uh, in the particle, you can efficiently calculate the spectra using our simulation algorithm. It's extremely useful when you want to automatically um, interpret the spectra because you can somehow compare the experimental with our model, our theoretical spectra. And I will talk about modeling fragmentation process. Uh, this uh, fragmentation can be done on the several level. In this talk, I will describe the fragmentation of peptides in the cell, but also the same uh, methodology can be used to analyze the fragmentation of particles inside the mass spectrometer, because to make the process, the measurement process uh, more efficient, sometimes people want to collide the particles with uh, heavy ions and to make the particles uh, in, in smaller. Okay. Why? People use uh, mass spectrometry, mostly for biomarker detection, um, for some diagnosis, diagnosis and prognosis, also um, disease tissue identification, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy is for drugs quality check. So. I, I don't like to talk about uh, NMR in details, but I only thought, okay. Why we are so fascinating in, this, uh, in the processing of such mass spectrometry signals? Because at the first uh, look, it doesn't look uh, so interesting. It's the processing signals spectra for computer scientists, it's quite boring. But in fact, uh, there is very nice intrinsic structure in the data because of the existence of stable isotopes. You probably know that uh, in nature we have uh, different elements like um, 
carbon, hydrogen, sulfur, and all these elements have several stable isotopes, like C12 for carbon with 12 neutrons, and C13 for carbon with 13 neutrons. But the same for hydrogen and deuter. For sulfur, we have like four stable isotopes. And this is why when we put into mass spectrometer the population of molecules, we obtain as a spectrum a whole bunch of peaks like here. So it's from only one single so population of the same molecules. What does it mean? There are several peaks. The first one, the lightest one, is called the monoisotopic peak because it corresponds to the subpopulation of molecules when where all particles have has this mm, lightest variance of these stable isotopes. So no deuter, no C13, and so on. Then we can see the next peak, one to the right, and it means that in this population there is at least one atom with a heavier variant, with one additional neutron, and so on and so on. Here we assume that there is no difference uh, in weight when neutron is the um, connected to carbon and to high hydrogen. But in fact, we have now so um, good uh, instruments that we can see this uh, mass difference. So the spectra is much more uh, sophisticated, in fact. There is um, exponential number of different isotopologues, we say. So the same particle, but different isotopic patterns. And so having such a nice structure, one can develop uh, a lot of combinatorial algorithm to interpret this. And so let's go for fragmentation. So it was already 10 years ago, we analyzed data mm, they were blood serum data. Yes, okay. Hi, um, could you please explain the plot in the previous slide? Uh, previous one? A little bit in more detail. Mm -hmm. What is on the x-axis and y-axis? And Okay, so this uh, spectrum here, you mean? Okay, these are intensity, so the number of particles detected uh, of a given mass. Let's forget about uh, charge. Assume that these are um, only one charge, so on the x-axis you have a mass of the particle, and here you have the intensity. And this is, uh, of course, the binomial distribution. We can uh, simplify that uh, finding k heavier atoms in the particle is the same as having k success in the, in the Bernoulli trials, okay? When the sum of uh, different uh, atoms is in, in all right, thank you. So it's like a histogram yeah. of mm -hmm. different um, mass-valued particles. Thank you. Exactly. Okay. And one more question here. Uh, so when you say particles, what do you mean? It's a molecule of amino acid. How small is it? So it depends. Uh, there are the branch of mass spectrometry when they put the intact proteins, like a whole capsule of uh, HIV protein in the spectrometer. But what I'm analyzing here are small peptides. 
So we have a blood serum from patients, and first uh, the proteins are digested and put in the spectrometer, and we analyze um, data. I think the threshold was like uh, several thousand Daltons. One amino acid is like 400 Daltons, 500 Daltons. Thank so. you. Okay, so we analyzed data from patients from two different diseases, colorectal cancer and uh, cystic fibrosis. And we had uh, spectra from diseased people and healthy donors, and uh, our collaborators wanted us to find a biomarkers. It's a very obvious problem. We want to have uh, signals that discriminate well between two groups of patients. After several months, we detected beautiful biomarkers. So from our point of view, the task uh, was completed because we had uh, signals that discriminate perfectly between these two samples groups. At what was uh, even much more interesting, it was that when samples uh, were stored uh, not appropriately, so we had the problem with a fridge. Normally you should store the blood samples in a fridge on minus 80 degrees. But uh, when you, we have uh, the time a problem with electricity and the samples were installed appropriately, then our discrimination were even, even better. And it was something very, very funny. But uh, after detecting those biomarkers, our collaborators were completely disappointed because uh, these peptides we found were from the most abundant proteins. So they were simply no interesting for them. Okay, and then we mm, realized that it's not the mm, problem of different proteins, but what uh, differs two groups are a different pattern of protein degradation. Simply there are another set of enzymes uh, they work in uh, healthy donors and another set of enzymes uh, that degrade patients, so blood of patients, and that also explained why this uh, electricity problems was in favor of our analysis. Because uh, in a higher temperature, this proteolysis process goes uh, further and we have uh, better samples to distinguish, in fact. Okay, so that time our goal was to design first formal model of proteolysis, which can be estimated from high throughput mass spectrometry data. As uh, we are mathematicians, we at the beginning, uh, assume a very simple model of enzyme, namely so-called exopeptidases. There are several enzymes cutting. They are called uh, proteases or peptidases. But exopeptidases, they are cutting only one letter from the left or from the right side of the peptide, so-called N-terminus and C-terminus. And we assume that for us, the set of exipeptidase are simply 40 mm, numbers. So 40 numbers means the intensity of cutting 20 letters from the left and 20 for the right. Okay, so first of all, we constructed so-called a cleavage graph. 
cleavage graph has uh, one source and one sink, and we collect so-called precursor peptides. In this mass spectrometry experiment, you can uh, select uh, several signals which are intense enough and ask the spectrometer to sequence these signals. So they make the next run cut the peptide into all prefixes and suffixes, and then after waiting all prefixes, all suffixes, you can decipher the sequence of amino acids. These are precursor peptides. So at the uh, we start from these peptides, and then we generate all possible substrings resulting from cutting one letter from the left or one letter from the right. Those graphs are huge, in fact. But uh, we model, we started for patient data with like two hundreds of precursor peptides and the graphs have several thousands of nodes. And we model the dynamic of degradation process as a mark of chain, describing the flow of particles through the graph. The particle in a given node represents a molecule, a peptide of a given uh, sequence. And this peptide can flow down by uh, degrading. So it's simply we have three uh, possible changing of configuration of this Markov chain. Uh, first and last is uh, only for technical reason to assure the ergodicity of the cell. So we assume that we can create the particle in any node. It's not completely stupid because uh, except of these exopeptidase, there are exists also endopeptidase, which can cut any place in the protein. So we can assume that uh, um, a peptide can be created and also peptide can be annihilated in any node. It means uh, in the mass spec experiments that it's not charged because we can observe only charged peptides. If we have no additional protons, in the peptide, so we cannot observe. It's, we can assume that it's annihilated, and we can move through the age. One can prove that the equilibrium of this uh, the stationary distribution of this Markov chain is, in fact, uh, very simple. It's the product of Poisson distribution. And the intuition is uh, quite nice because it's like the quite um, the flow on the graph here. These particles they don't collide, so there is no quiz in the graph. If you consider a given node and you ask how many particles are in this node. It's more or less the same as finding the appropriate path to this node. And all these paths are independent. So the path here, there's always this uh, graph is binary. So there's always two possibilities. And so more or less like uh, having uh, K success in uh, several Bernoulli tries. So it means that there's more or less a binomial distribution in the case uh, here is approximated by Poisson distribution. And these intensities of Poisson distribution should follow, fulfill so-called balance condition. And this balance condition is also very easy to prove just to check whether uh, 
this is uh, stationary. Balance is the same as mass conservation law. Namely, the inflow into the given node should be the same as the outflow from the node. Okay, so we have already the Markov chain describing the flow of particles, and we have graphs, cleavage graphs, constructed for real data. It means we start with uh, 200 precursors and we generate all possible substrings. It was like 40,000. The, the size of the graph is huge. But now we want to put uh, real data into this graph. And it's not so trivial because from the amino acid sequence, it's very easy to calculate the mass because we know how much uh, an amino acid's weight is. So we can sum and have the mass of the given peptide. But uh, in fact, in these experiments, we have it's not one dimensional spectrum. You can see there's a second dimension here, and this dimension is called retention time. This spectrometer is coupled with so-called liquid chromatography. We have a column together with mass spectrometer, and all molecules should go through this column. And these which are uh, more uh, hydrophilic go smoothly and goes uh, quicker through the column. And this is only the separation technique just to separate uh, signals having the same mass, yes, according to their solvability. And it was highly non-trivial to predict this retention time for a given mass, but somehow it was doable by some regression. Okay, then we put our data into the graph, but most of nodes were empty because we have like thousand. Okay, I have a question here. Okay. So, thousand of peptides in a given spectra and forty thousand of nodes. So it means that uh, when you have one mass, like two molecules at the same mass, then the rotation time is different and they are different molecules? So you, you ask about this uh, liquid chromatography. Yes. Yes. It's this, um, for example, here, you have almost the same mass, okay? About, uh, I don't know, 500 Daltons. Mm -hmm. But what differs, these two signals, are um, solvability, okay? Because you have uh, this column, and you put all particles, all molecules into the column, and those, some of them are quicker, goes quicker, and some, this retention time, I think here is better. You can see here 65 seconds. The whole experiment lasts like two hours, in fact. And it is very sensitive to the conditions. Like uh, there is a tram near the laboratory, and when the tram goes, uh, you can observe the disturbance here in the retention time. Yes, but uh, most of the experiments uh, in proteomics is done using this liquid chromatography. So, in fact, we have two-dimensional data. And this is why now we are fighting with two-dimensional Wasserstein metrics, because it's not so easy to calculate as a one-dimensional Wasserstein. So, I will touch this later. Mm. Okay. So it's the whole diagram of data processing. So at the beginning, we collect the sequences 
of precursor peptides uh, from mass spec experiments. We construct the cleavage graph. And here you can observe two paths. The uh, left one is for e real data. So we put the observation into the graph. Most of nodes are empty, in fact. But there is also the right path. Oh, no, no, no. The right path here is artificial observation generation. Because so we, our aim is to construct the estimation procedure, the model of this activity. So we want to infer 40 numbers, the activity of the set of enzymes. But uh, how we know that uh, this estimation procedure is correct? So the best way is to simulate this proteolysis process with already known activities and then try to estimate from the procedure. And this is the right path artificial observation generation, cleavage graph filled with artificial observation, estimation of model parameters, and then we can evaluate the estimation procedure. Great. Yeah, now it's uh, a bit technical um, stuff because we have to reparameterize the model. In the Markov chain, here, we have A. Vector A is the vector of intensities. Okay, It's the same as the probability of moving from one node to another. It's what we want to estimate, this A vector. There is 40,000 of nodes in the graph, but only 40 parameters. It's a nice situation. And we want to estimate these 40 parameters. The problem is that, uh, in fact, what we know, they are relative cutting intensity, not absolute values. So we want to reparameterize, so just to normalize. And the vector B is now normalized. Okay? They, they are proportions of uh, different enzymes. So proportions of activities of different enzymes. Okay? So from now, now on we want to estimate a vector, vector B, not A. Okay, here is the finite hierarchical Bayesian model for the problem. Why it is so sophisticated? Do you have any ideas? Because, uh, so, these lambdas are intensities in a Poisson distribution of our Markov chain. The vector x is a vector of observables. The number of particles, number of peptides having a given sequence is uh, distributed uh, according to Poisson distribution with the parameters lambda. That's right, but there are several problems. First, as I said, um, almost 90% uh, or even more of these nodes are empty in the graph. So we have a missing values, missing readings. So we cannot find the signal in the patient data. So we have a random variable epsilon. It's observable. Okay, we know when the reading is missing, when the signal cannot be found in the data, and then the epsilon is zero, and when we found epsilon is one. Okay, there is also the problem of errors. We can make a mistake 
while predicting this retention time, and we don't know whether the mistake is whether the reading is correct or not. This is modeled by delta variable, and we assume it's a Bernoulli distributed data variable. And if it's only uh, for those uh, readings which are not missing, okay? But this part is simply the this reparametrization, okay? To have the normalized cutting intensities B instead of A vector. But there is also the last level. A problem with this Poisson distribution is the following. Uh, for the higher signal, you have... Uh, mm, it, it's simply mm, in a contradiction with the um, characteristic of mass spectrometric data. We have to regularize it and say, okay, we cannot observe X, but we in fact observe Y, uh, and the vector Y is log normal distributed uh, with uh, around X, okay? It's the next technical um, decision, but also, mm, there are noise, and the noise is uh, have some background distribution. When delta is zero, means that uh, these are errors in the data. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, the decisions behind taking some uh, probability distributions like Bernoulli, Poisson, and log normal. Uh, is it, are there like to work, or mm -hmm. is there something more behind it? So, Bernoulli is obvious, because it's uh, just a decision whether... Um, because it's, we assume that it is independent whether it's the error or not the error, it's just a Bernoulli distribution. The Poisson come from this theorem about the stationary distribution the Markov chain, and the log normal is our expert knowledge that you should to uh, have a logarithm of all signal <laughs> when you analyze the mass spectrometry data. Okay, so having the hierarchical model, we have the posterior distribution for so here it's uh, according to the model is proportional to all this distribution and we manage to integrate out some of the variables but not all of them um, in fact we we cannot integrate X and B star. What is B star? So X, you know what is it. It's those uh, um, variable which is a Poisson distribution, which has Poisson distribution. And B, fortunately we can integrate out the normalization, this reparametrization S, and we can integrate out the delta. But what is B star? We can go here. Okay. Mm. So B star is uh, not uh, crucial parameters because it uh, corresponds to the creation of a particle, but we are interested in the movement of particles, these uh, intensities. And, uh, but uh, still, we have to calculate the posterior, like here, 
and it should be done by Markov chain Monte Carlo procedure. So we cannot, uh, so we have the closed form expression for this posterior, but we cannot eliminate B star and X. So it means that we estimate the posterior from Metropolis Hastings procedure. We just sample from the posterior distribution this triple, okay? Updating uh, in any step according to the closed form formula of this distribution. I, I don't like to go into details of this, but it's a standard uh, way because I didn't put the closed form distribution uh, for uh, those uh, B star and X. Okay, so after performing this Metropolis hustings to approximate the posterior, we have our 40 numbers and for artificial data, it's here. So we mm, train the procedure several times and here is uh, the outcome. And we know that uh, errors are, we can neglect the errors. It's perfect, the estimation is perfect. So we know the um, real activities because we simulate artificial data and we can reconstruct all the activities. It's beautiful. In this uh, middle panel, we somehow simulated a real situation. We assumed 90% of errors and 90% of missing data and 10% of errors, or even maybe 40% of errors, and we obtain such estimates. Of course, now the error bars are, but still, the line correspond to real intensities, okay? It's still no bad. So after performing those two validations for artificial data, we tried for real data. And uh, errors are smaller, but of course we don't know the line here. We don't know what are the real activity, but okay, we were very, very happy. And then we decided to go, <laughs> now I should do something here. Now we decided to go further and try to play with real enzymes. Fortunately, there is a database called MEROPS, and it's the database of all proteolytic events. So people are collecting there, then proteolytic event is a triple, substrate, peptide, enzyme, some specific enzyme, and a point of cutting. It's a proteolytic event. And each enzyme, in fact, has their own specificity. So it prefers to cut in a specific place. And it recognizes like four amino acids to the left and four to the right of a cutting cleavage uh, point. And according to the composition of amino acids, some enzymes are preferred uh, given place. Then having this knowledge, we can construct another cleavage graph, which is now the Petri net. In fact, it's a bipartite graph. We have two sets of vertices. One corresponds to peptides, is the blue vertices, and the second one corresponds to the set of 
enzymes. And now there are specific enzymes cutting in a specific places. And we can do a similar stuff. We have a similar balance condition for the graph. The inflow of the graph should be the same as the uh, outflow from the graph. But in this situation, our graphs are much more smaller and better filled by the data. And what's the most important, we can identify real enzyme, not only 40 intensities, not only numbers, but real enzymes that are working in real cells. And what's the most important, uh, those identifying enzymes uh, really, they make sense. They are somehow related to the disease under consideration. Some of them are um, so important factors in the metastasis and also could be targets for anti-cancer therapy and we were really proud of uh, designing the model. So, do you have any question concerning the proteolysis model? So, it's, it's extremely boring. You have a question? Uh, yeah, I actually have a question because uh, you are talking a lot about the posteriors, but mm -hmm. do you encourage some priors in your model, I, I don't know, taken from literature mm -hmm. or s some prior knowledge to, to this character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, here, these priors are mostly natural one. If okay. we have proportion, so we put uh, Dirichlet priors for the mm -hmm. proportions. Some priors uh, are in fact, taken from a data. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if it's possible, we always want to have a conjugate priors mm -hmm. to make all the uh, calculation um, easier. But uh, sometimes uh, we have some expert knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and another question. Do you play a little bit with them? Uh, I mean that, for example, do you see if, uh, for example, you change this gamma distribution to another one, will uh, will affect with mm -hmm. uh, some different behavior of your model? Uh, in fact, uh, as we can manage to integrate out this uh, mm -hmm. shape, uh, it has <laughs> no influence, okay. but. Uh, we checked several this background distribution, and uh, it was rather robust. Okay, cool, thanks. Yes. Okay, so let's make a small digression to uh, refer to the yesterday lecture, because I said uh, the Wasserstein metric is uh, really a beautiful idea to apply in the analysis of mass spectra. Here, you can see two spectra. The bottom one is quercetin, and above is apigenin. Two small molecules, very similar one to another. The only difference here are two oxygen atoms. Okay, the hydrogen atoms are not uh, put on this here, but the oxygen is lacking here and here, okay? But when we look, and these molecules are also fragmented before putting in a mass spectrometer. For example, this, this ring, the red one, is the piece of a molecule and is here in the spectra, 
in the spectrum, and this yellow is here, the masses, 153 Daltons, and okay. But when you look at those two spectra, they are completely different. They have only one peak in common, but most of the metrics used so far in the literature to analyze, to compare mass spectra, they calculate the common peaks. So these are completely different, but molecules are almost the same. Yes? This question. So how do you get the colors here? So from the mass spectra, you only get the intensity. Yeah, yeah, okay. The colors now are coding the optimal transport. So now I would like to apply this uh, Wasserstein distance to this spectra. And it's a natural way to compare them. We can think about transporting the mass, the intensity of ions from one spectra to another just to perform the minimal amount of work. Work is the mass multiplied by distance. So it's clear that this yellow mass, you can think about the cake of sand, like sand cake, when, and the sand is colored in a different uh, colors. So this sand cake is moved here, and the work is minimal, and also this sand cake should be um, put in three different places here, and so on. This uh, huge sand cake has to be scattered into several places here, and so on. So I think it's uh, natural to compare. And and what's nice, the Wasserstein distance between those two is more or less equal to 32 Dalton. So 32. So two questions here and also here. I, uh, sorry, but what are the two spectra under consideration here? So the first spectra is uh, this uh, above is apigenin, is this particle. And this bottom one is quercetin. Very similar molecules. Okay. And oh, also I see. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> so maybe it's not the best picture, but at least it's a colorful. That, so when you say that, uh, for example, the red color is now in three different places, it means that they are three different isotopes? No, no, no. So forgot now about isotopes. You have uh, one spectra here, and it is colored according to different peaks. Okay? Assume it's a very bad resolution. So we cannot see the isotopes. We have simply this part of proteins having the mass of uh, 153 Daltons, and it's here, and this lighter bit ring, which is here on the 119 Daltons, okay? So what happens in the lower bar? Mm -hmm. And now we want to move all these masses, this spectra, into another spectra, on the, the second molecule. And it looks like here. If we forget about the colors, we have a different histogram. And now we want to quantify the distance between those two probability distribution. In fact, we assume later that uh, the spectra are normalized, so we can compare two probability distribution. Okay. So it was really a great idea to apply the Wasserstein here, but uh, the most uh, Interesting result was to use the uh, Wasserstein distance to deconvolve the spectra. Here you can see one spectrum, which is black one, is experimental spectrum, say, it's artificial example. It's measured by a mass spectrometer. But also you have three different 
theoretical spectra. Assume that this is a mixture, the black one, which is composed of three components. Yeah. So we analyze the blood serum of a patient, but we know that there should be at least uh, three different peptides inside. But there are also some peaks without interpretation. This can be, we can suspect that it's uh, this uh, signal from um, brown molecule. This could be signal from green and magenta one, but these peaks uh, constitute what we call the chemical noise. It's something uh, extra in the spectra. So we can say that uh, our experimental spectrum is a linear combination of theoretical one, plus it's a model, plus some noise. And then we can do a Wasserstein regression regression using Wasserstein distance to find the proportion of the spectra. But what is additionally uh, done here is this uh, additional point called uh, vortex by us where we can move all unnecessary spectra with constant penalty. We just extend the Wasserstein distance, the optimal transport, with the possibility of transporting into this vortex. Okay? And it uh, really works. Here you have uh, two the overlapping isotopic envelopes of two hemoglobin chains, so-called alpha chain and delta chain. They are mixed in the proportions, known proportions are here, and the estimated proportions are below. So not uh, maybe identical, but still it's a very good result, especially as we can eliminate the noise here. And, well, the next idea was to apply this Wasserstein regression to nuclear magnetic resonance spectra. It looks more or less similar to mass spec data, but uh, what is really important for us in most applications, we deal with one-dimensional spectra. Because in mass spectrometry, as you have seen in this proteolysis example, we have two-dimensional. We had this retention time dimension. And uh, in that case, it's very hard to apply Wasserstein approach because you need to have a two-dimensional Wasserstein, which is not so efficient as one-dimensional. But here, for nuclear magnetic resonance, you can apply a simple one-dimensional optimal transport between spectra. And the problem is the same. To deconvolve the mixture into components discover the proportion of different, uh, yeah, we have a mixture and uh, several compounds and we want to discover the proportion, but now we have to introduce one additional vortex more, because here we have no theoretical spectra. We have no efficient algorithms for simulating spectra for a given molecular um, formula. But all is experimentally measured, both mixture and 
components are measured experimentally. This is why we have to account for the noise in the mixture and the noise in the component. So we have two vortexes and we can, while doing this optimal transport, we can transport some noise or from uh, both spectra into this additional point we are given. We have two different penalties now. And we can, uh, this is why we can in fact deal with different uh, situations very mm, hard. Um, so up to now people couldn't compare the spectra, nuclear magnetic resonance spectra for um, low resolution and high resolution at the same time. Assuming that the components are measured in one resolution and a mixture is measured in very uh, low resolution, for example. Now, applying our Wasserstein matrix and Wasserstein regression, you can deconvolve the spectra and the tool is called uh, Magnetstein because of magnetic nuclear resonance. And uh, our collaborators are extremely happy to, to have it to analyze. And what's important, it's still the problem can be formulated as linear programming and we can efficiently solve it by a simplex method. Of course, there are several implementation of simplex method, I can advertise uh, Gurobi optimization is the best one, is much, much faster than another. Okay, do you have any question to Wasserstein distance? Yes, do uh, you have a question? So, let's go <laughs> at the time. Uh, can you please explain the concept of a vortex again? Like why you chose a vortex and what it does? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here the notion of optimal transport is clear. So we are transporting uh, sand cakes from one spectra to another. So doing the minimal amount of work. When we have some noise in the data, we don't like to transport this noisy peak to some model, theoretical model. It's always uh, the question of transporting between two spectra. Here, the transport is between the black spectrum and this color mixture, but those peaks are so-called chemical noise. Something uh, unnecessary was put in the spectrometer or even um, hair <laughs> there. So it, it happens, in fact. Or some piece of uh, a plant uh, from the window. Okay, so we want to not to transport it. And this is why we add some additional point to the spectra, and we transport all those peaks into this point with a constant work. We call this penalty. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I have one more question. Do you consider during this project any other uh, metrics or distances instead of Wasserstein? I mean like Hellinger distance or something like that? Mm -hmm. There are several approaches for regression. Mm -hmm. mm, yes, and you can find in the li literature, but uh, Wasserstein is much better. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Okay, so we still have five minutes. No, 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 20 minutes. Okay, so 
we still have five minutes. No, 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 20 minutes. I'm right. Okay, so <laughs> we can uh, talk a bit about uh, gene, gene regulation. It's quite different topics, and uh, but it's a central problem in molecular biology to understand the gene regulation. In fact, uh, mm, I think the good example here is this butterfly and the caterpillar, because these two animals clearly they have the same genome yes but they look completely different yes sometimes if you are an expert you can say this caterpillar is for this butterfly but uh, normally what uh, differs is the expression pattern so and in fact, we have almost the same genome with monkeys, mouses, yeasts. We have almost the same set of genes, but the expression pattern is different. And this is why it's very crucial to model the gene regulation, regulation of gene expression. Okay. The gene regulation is not a cyclic. You have a cell cycle, even. Yeah. So this is why we will apply dynamic Bayesian networks. And in the case of gene regulation, the vertices, the random variables here, are activity of genes and arrow means that uh, the activity of this gene is somehow depends on the activity of another gene. But uh, yeah, the framework, uh, you can mm, also handle both discrete and continuous variables. For example, here you have uh, so this is discrete variable A with three state A1, A2, A3, and a continuous. It's a parent of continuous variable B. So B depends on A. And if A is in some state, B has a Gaussian distribution. And so we can infer the likelihood of B having the knowledge about A, and what is important is that we have this factorization. The joint probability of the network is factorized according to the graph. But what is non-trivial mm, here is to infer the direction of an edge. But what are the data? Data are mostly mm, so-called uh, gene expression experiments. So we measure the expression of all genes in a cell. We have the expression of uh, several mm, thousands of genes, or 50,000 of genes at the moment. But then we can infer the dependence, but it's not uh, the correlation we can infer. But it's not uh, easy to know what is the direction of the arrow. And this is why uh, better is to have a time series of gene expression, or even the perturbation experiments. The perturbation means that we can knock out a gene, knock out, uh, so we eliminate a gene from the system. Sometimes it's lethal, but sometimes not. And we can observe how it influences all activity pattern of other genes. And uh, overexpression is uh, another possibility to have the maximum level of expression of a given gene. So there are two kinds of these perturbation experiments. 
So dynamic Bayesian networks is the representation of stochastic uh, evolution of the set of random variables. So we have uh, the time is discretized and, and all these temporal processes are assumed to be to have a Markov property and to be a time homogeneous. So we have uh, probability of uh, our configuration x in time t depending on, so it's uh, all, all the Markov property, Markov of memory one step. And here is the factorization. Okay. So, what is the interfering uh, Bayesian network here means? We want to find the graph, the network, that uh, matches a given uh, time series the best. What, what does it mean, the match, how we score this match? Uh, I think it should be clear here. Okay, the problem is with this perturbation experiments is that uh, when the expression of uh, one gene is uh, perturbed, it of course influences the whole system. And uh, we have to, to look at the data carefully. When some genes are perturbed, we cannot use, we have to use selectively the data, simply. But the learning algorithm is in fact very, very simple here. It's mm, so-called uh, exact algorithm. For each gene, we choose all experiments with uh, unperturbed expression of this gene. Then for each potential parent set of this gene. At the beginning, we just consider all subsets. Yeah, it's exponential. But at least we when we have a small network, it's doable. Okay? Uh, compute the local score of this uh, uh, connections of this graph. And then we choose the optimal score. It's a, like a greedy approach. And what does it mean to uh, compute the score? Here we decided to have uh, a minimum description length score. Minimum description length uh, does quantify how the model explains data, okay? And this score is the cost of coding the model, the number of bits, and the cost of coding the data given the model. The best realization of this score could be a Kolmogorov of complexity. It means the the size of the program, so for a given sequence, we want to have a program that uh, prints the sequence and halts. And the length of the program is the commoger of complexity of our sequence. Unfortunately, it is um, uncomputable, so <laughs> we cannot <laughs> calculate efficiently commoger of complexity, but still for this uh, MDL score, we can do it and construct for at least for small example a graph. Here is the example of real network. So these funny zigzags are mRNA and there are all over more than 50 species of different molecules, but only 10 genes, okay? The genes A, B, C, D, there are only 10 genes, but also there are mm, promoters, transcription factors, mRNAs, and so on. And all together, the network has mm, 
about uh, 100 interactions. But, okay, now we have this network. We have also real experimental data, but the problem is uh, how to quantify the false positives, because there are experiments that uh, mm, describe the existence of the interaction between two genes. And often it's a very good uh, PhD to find a new interaction about the gene. But uh, there are no experiments that uh, states that there are no interaction. Yeah? It would be very nice to have a journal of negative results when people publish such <laughs> negative results, but it's not the case. And this is why when we infer the network from real data, we can have almost all false positives, in fact. And this is why we validate our approach by, okay. Um, could you please explain the graph in the previous slide further? What are different shapes? What are Okay, this, arrows? Uh, mm -hmm. so in fact, I wanted to skip this because uh, it's the explanation of these different shapes is in fact these pictures. The process of transcription is extremely complex. You have a DNA, and this red part is uh, some, uh, so green is gene, the red is promoter of the gene, and you can see a plenty of bubbles here. And all these bubbles are proteins that are necessary to initiate these transcriptions, different promoters, enhancer, transcription factors, and so on. And it is uh, here, this state for zigzags for mRNA, it means uh, this uh, from DNA, the central dogma of molecular biology is the information flow is from DNA through RNA to proteins. So we have uh, uh, at the beginning uh, DNA, mRNA, and the proteins, and this is why different shapes here. But we can simplify it into such a graph with only 10 proteins. So. Let's start with this simple graph. And now the idea is to validate the approach formally. So first try to describe the dynamics of uh, this expression in the graph by means of the system or the uh, ordinary differential equation system, okay? Then we can, before trying on real data, we can simulate data from this ODE, and we can use such artificial expression data to reconstruct the network. And if we know the real topology, because we know the system of um, ordinary differential equations, we can compare whether our network is good enough or not. And after such validation, it makes sense to try with real expression data. What was the result? So first we, mm, we start with a system of uh, ODE describing such a network, and we also simulate a perturbation experiment. So it's really easy in ODE to simulate a knockout or overexpression, much easier than in a living cell. And what are the final results? We found knockout and overexpression uh, the efficiency of the whole procedure was really poor. From real network, like here, these are all 
true positives. All edges are positives. Those dotted edges are some another kind of interaction, but still we want to infer all these edges. And we, the, the, we can only infer those four edges. And we had additional three false positives. So it doesn't look nice yeah, without knockout, without these perturbation experiments. Only time series simulated from the system of ODE. Yeah, why I am talking about this? Because there is a plenty of approach in the literature when people are using Bayesian approaches to real data, but without any validation. And okay, but after uh, we add this perturbation experiment, still to the artificial system, we can infer now true positive rate is 10 over 15. So it's much, much better than before. Okay, so I have still three minutes. But so it's, uh, mm, it's the final slide about the uh, gene regulatory network. What I'm interested in now is the evolution of gene regulation. In fact, the evolution of uh, regulation is much faster than genome revolution, but of course it's uh, stimulated by a genome revolution. Um, sometimes there are um, pieces in the genome, even a human genome, called uh, transposons. These are um, pieces of DNA that can be um, copy-paste in the genome. Some of them are so-called autonomous. They are coding their own enzymes to move in the genome, and the, like 40% of our genome uh, consisting of these transposons. And it is uh, fascinating that the speciation events are correlated with the bars of transposon proliferation. Because, as I said, this transcription process involves a lot of different transcription factors. And in fact, the place, these promoter regions, the place when those proteins bind to DNAs called transcription factor binding sites, they are coming from transposons. When transposons proliferate and uh, they decrease the amount in the genome, they produce new transcription factor binding sites and a new expression pattern can emerge in a new species, in fact. The another important point is the chromatin. When we change a little in the genome, we always chin is uh, misplaced and regulates uh, different genes. This is also important cancer driver mechanism. But what I'm interested in is more on the level of molecular evolution, not on the level of a single existence and uh, cancer. And one of the open problems I'm working now is to develop a deep learning model which is capable to predict how the genome rearrangements resulting from chromosome or um, chromosome rearrangement from transposition or transposome activity or another mm, events on activity or another mm, events, uh, these uh, events can uh, influence the chromatin structure, and this in, uh, results in this enhanced hijacking and exaptation. So, thank you very much for your attention. I also want to like, thank my collaborators. Uh, many thanks for your inspiring talk.
I'm afraid we are running out of time, and but we have time for one quick question if you still have any. So maybe I will ask, uh, did you use in real world some of your uh, projects or models or something like that? Uh, you mean... Uh, uh, I mean, did you use it like oh, in, in real medicine? World. Yep. Yes, uh, it depends. Uh, in fact, uh, we managed to uh, discover a new genomic disorder. I think it's the real world application. So we just detected the same pattern of uh, genome rearrangement in the group of people having the same symptoms and so. It's a part of a PhD thesis of my, of Piotrek Dietfeld. Where is Piotrek? There, here with I said, baguette. And uh, yeah, people even said this uh, should be the Dietfeld syndrome, but okay. <laughs> it wasn't the case. That's really cool, maybe sometime in the future. So once again, many thanks, mm -hmm. and we'll see you in half an hour, because right now we have a tea break. Thanks.